Hello and welcome to another session in English language. And today our focus is on first structure. We're going to be looking at clauses. What is a clause? What are the types of clauses? Then secondly, we we'll look at speech work, stress pattern on the fifth and sixth syllable. And lastly, we'll take something on comprehension. But before all of that, let us review the previous lesson. Welcome back. Like I said today, we are taking first a lesson on structure. That's clauses. What is a clause? Okay, a clause is a group of words that contains a finite verb. Okay, it contains a finite verb. That's what a clause is. Okay. Then, um, for instance, we have what you call the types of clauses. Okay, the independent clause and the dependent clause. So the independent clause here could be the referee blew his whistle. Then the dependent clause there is and the match stop. So you can see and the match stop is a clause. The referee blew his whistle is also another clause. The only thing is that one is a main clause and the other is a subordinate clause. So another name for independent clause is main clause. Another name for dependent clause is subordinate clause. Aside that, we can also see another name for independent clause is principal clause. So we can call it independent clause, main clause, or the principal clause. But the other one is dependent or subordinate clause. Now, so when we say independent clauses, they are simply clauses that express a complete thought and can stand on its own. Okay? My English teacher is a kind man. So this is an example of an independent clause. Okay, it does not need any other elements or sentence elements to express a complete thought. The maid cooked, cooked dinner. But in the case of a dependent or subordinate clause, it cannot express first a complete thought and also it cannot stand on its own. It has to depend on the independent clause for its meaning. For instance, you can't just say while the boy was sleeping. What happened while the boy was sleeping? So while the boy was sleeping is an is, is a dependent or subordinate clause. The goat which ate our yam. What happened to the goat which ate our yam? Okay. So that is what you should know about dependent clauses and independent clauses, or what you call subordinate clauses and principal or main clauses, right? So there are three types of subordinate clauses. I repeat, there are three types of subordinate clauses. Okay, we have a noun clause, is a type of subordinate clause. We have a type clause, is a type of subordinate clause, and we have what? Adverbial clauses also. So let's begin with the noun clause. Like the name implies, it performs the function of a noun. And what are the functions of a noun? It could serve as the subject of the verb. What he said is bitter. So the expression what he said is a noun clause, occupying the position of the subject in the sentence. Alright? The cook gave us what we should eat. What we should eat here is a noun clause, occupying the position of the object. Then we have honesty is what we want. Telling us more about honesty. Okay, so he's serving as a subject complement, and we call him what he likes. All right, what he likes is a noun clause, you know, serving as an object complement. Object complement. Then we have the prize will go to whoever wins, and that's the complement of the preposition. So, 
So then we move on to what is called adjectival clause. Adjectival clause, like we know, is a clause that behaves or performs the function of an adjective. And what do adjectives do majorly? They modify a noun or a pronoun. For instance, the man who came here is a teacher. So this expression is an adjectival clause modifying the noun phrase the man. Okay? So let's move on to what you call adverbial clause. Now, an adverbial clause, like we said, is a type of subordinate clause that performs or behaves like an adverb. And what do adverbs do? Adverbs modify verbs. Adverbs modify adjectives. And adverbs modify other They modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Okay, so that's that is the function of adverbs. They modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. So they tell us how an action was performed, when, why, to what extent, under what condition an action was performed. Are they saw him? Where? When she came to his office. Okay? So, with that, let's move on to another aspect, which is stress on the fifth and sixth syllable. Remember, we've been talking about stress pattern, or what you call syllabic stress. Okay? So, when we have a word that is of five syllables, how do we stress that? So five syllable words that end in ION or ITY, the stress is placed on the second syllable from the end or and the third syllable from the end when it has to do with ITY. So ION, five syllable words and stress on the second syllable from the end. ION words that are five syllables are stressed on the second syllable from the end. Why ity words that are five syllables are stressed on the third syllable from the end. For instance, administration. So now that's the five syllable. Administration. Now, so the stress is on stration. So it's administration. So we have authenticity. That's five syllables. So but the stress is on T. So it's authenticity. So we have consideration, okay, conductivity, communication, possibility, okay. So we could also have words that are six syllables, okay. And when we have an ION in a six syllable, please do the same. Stress the second syllable of the ION from the end and stress the third syllable from the end on the ity personification that's six syllables so the stress is on k intensification but we also could have impossibility so the stress is on the third syllable from the end ability so it's on b so we also have responsibility all right so i believe you got that so when you practice more on this you will acquaint yourself and get better on stress pattern so let's move on to comprehension how to read for implied meanings like i told you comprehension you cannot be better at comprehension without improving your reading efficiency so it's it's very important that you improve your reading efficiency so and you can only do that by exposing yourself to several texts or passages okay so let's look at some tips that will help us you know read for implied meanings in other words we are saying that sometimes there is a tendency that the writer Okay, takes for granted what the reader, you know, the reader takes for granted what the writer actually has written. Okay, so no matter your 
your experience, no matter how much acquainted with the subject matter discussed in the passage, it's very important that you read thoroughly in order to understand what is required. So the following things will help you read for implied meanings. Number one, read the question before, during, and at the end of the reading assignment. So it's very important that you read at least twice. Okay, read the passage at least twice. Then also you have to pay attention to linking ideas. Okay, follow the writer's line of thought. There is something the writer is trying to what achieve. Then also you can bring in what you know or your background on a particular subject it will help you you know in this area but please don't substitute your idea with the writer's idea and please test any of your conclusions with the information given in the passage and ensure there are no conflicts with that so with this we've come to the end of today's lesson thank you for joining in order to refresh your memory and record all that has been taught, I would encourage you to take the lesson, the test rather, that appears on your screen.